Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. So we have moved into the season of Lent, and our first Sunday of Lent is February 18, 2024. The first reading is Genesis 9, 8 through 17. The psalm is Psalm 25, 1 through 10. Second reading is 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. And our gospel reading is Mark 1, 9 through 15. The first reading of the, well, the gospel reading for the first Sunday of Lent is always the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, which Mark narrates very, very briefly. <laughs> he was tempted. That's all we know. <laughs> Except the angels served. And he was with the wild beasts. There were wild beasts involved, yes. <laughs> we wasn't alone. Anyway. All right. Lent or something. I'm Lent. gonna say I, I'm gonna say uh first of all, just a, a shout out to 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 David uh uh Shasna da- Jacobson's commentary again. Um and uh that left me uh with uh three words. Uh, interruption of what is disruptive, intense, it brings its own struggle, but it is an inauguration. It's actually just the beginning. So interruption, intense, and inauguration, those are um, uh, the three words that um, that uh, kind of guide me as I looked at all of the text um, um, in light of this Matthew text, uh, this Mark text, and David's uh, commentary, um, I mentioned a couple of, of weeks back that we would talk about uh, the struggle, and here we are. That's what this season of Lent, uh, in some ways, uh, invites us to, and definitely for Jesus. Yeah, the commentary was really uh, useful, in particular, calling out the ways in which this launches something that. You know, let the healings, liberations from bondage to evil, the announcements of forgiveness, and the calls to transformation begin. It's on that this test of the wilderness unleashes something. That it's yeah, it's not just like, well, here's this. This is what you got to do next, and then you know, then the ministry will begin. But this is kind of opens some floodgates, and I, I think that that holds up right when mm-hmm. when Jesus is in the in the synagogue later in Mark chapter one the demon is kind of a little bit confused. Like, you know, what are you doing here? Uh, it's, it's an idiom, right? But like, you know, what have you to do with us? It's, Mm -hmm. there's been a breach, right? There's this, this turf war is now fully engaged and Mark under narrates that of course, but I think we want to note that. I think too, when you, yeah, it's on as, as David says, (laughs) and, uh, as David said, and but also it's on, and then the next, the next next Sunday will be Caesarea Philippi, and then the question is, so what do you say about that? You know, who do you, who do you say that Jesus is when all of this is on, mm-hmm. and uh, and so that's a way maybe maybe the preacher can connect this Sunday with. Uh, with the response of who do you say that I am at Caesarea Philippi and and uh, and just engage engage the listener in that uh, what are we what is our response to this ministry of Jesus and uh, and particularly for me that reminder also comes in verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Both of those verbs, I think we've talked about before, is fulfilled, has come near, are perfect tense. So we're not waiting for this to happen. It's already happened. The kingdom has come near and the time is fulfilled. The kingdom has come near. And so it's on. It's really on. It's like we're not waiting for the kingdom to show up. We're not waiting for the time to come. It's already happened. But now uh, what are the results of that happening? And part of those results are is response to that, and and so that's that's kind of where I was taking some of those um, themes as well. The intrusion that this is—it's interrupting what has disrupted 
this kingdom that has been promised, this good that we've been expecting or talking about. And I think your words, Caroline, are so critical um, because what is going to be the response uh, and David's, you know, it's, it's on. When is it on? It's on at the worst of times. And it, isn't that in many ways where we are? John has been arrested. You know, that this, this one who has drawn such a great following, has drawn such a great crowd, who seems to be ro- on the rise he, he's now been taken. He's now been taken under arrest, and yet this is the moment when the good news will be proclaimed. This is the moment when the time, when the recognition that the time has been fulfilled. But slow it down, Joy. This is the moment of the recognition that the time has been fulfilled, and that the kingdom of God is all around us. It's not going to get any better. It, it's almost like we were talking about last week. You're, you're not going to be perfect. So come where you are. And if we're looking for where God is showing up, it's an interruption of the brokenness. It's an interruption of the horror. It's an interruption of whatever has disrupted our world. And now is the time. That that's that's what I'd look at on this text. I was just going to say that it's I think important to tie this into the the presence of the Spirit as well. Thank which, you. Which, um, of course, is the reason why Jesus is in the wild in the first place. That this the Spirit uh, drives him there, and to see that, I, I think as Mark would see this, and this fits in many ways David's apocalyptic reading is. It, it, once the spirit breaches mm. uh, our, our world, right, and is in mm. our world, there simply has to be a conflict yes. with uh, w- with Satan, and so yes. there is a way in which these very sparsely narrated scenes are about kind of this the inevitability of this of this clash, and that will continue to play out. I think in some ways like it's coming next week as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When um, Caroline talked about Caesarea Philippi, there'll be an accusation that, that Peter is even, is even satanically possessed with his, mm-hmm. his vision of, of what Jesus is supposed to be and do. Uh, so just to kind of know, I don't, uh, preachers will deal with that in different ways or, uh, you know, adapt that language in different ways. But to see that the spirit is not just a kind of positive energy for Jesus, it's all about this conflict too, and that there has to be a, a dismantling of the current powers for this kingdom of God to um, find its home or to find its roots. I think another theme that I hear in this passage is we what's of course, interesting about Mark's version is it's this this sparse narration. I mean, it's just he was tempted, but we don't know the details of that of those temptations and and what did what did uh, Jesus experience in the w- wilderness, or what did he learn from those temptations about himself, about his ministry? You know, and we don't really get and we don't get any of that in Mark. But what we do get. Well, besides the wild beasts, which I don't quite know what to do with, but what we do get is the angels waited on him. And as as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, with Simon's mother-in-law, the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, that she she serves them, which mm-hmm. is the same verb as here. Yes. And mm-hmm. so what difference does it make that one thing that Jesus did learn or did experience in the midst of that temptation and the midst of the wilderness is the presence of God's angels serving him. And how did that then have uh, an effect on his own ministry Uh, that that experience in the wilderness was then, then is carried forward and how, how Simon's mother-in-law his response is service, and then he summarizes his own ministry and service. Mm-hmm. And so there's something there for me as well, that that one of the things that he experienced, in the, one thing he experienced in the wilderness, he carries forward in his ministry. And uh, and what difference does that make? Genesis? Maybe we should point out that the uh, the Old Testament reading throughout Lent is going to jump around quite a bit. 
and we're going to get uh, a number of covenants mm-hmm. here in year B. Mm-hmm. Here, the one with Noah, we're going to have a, a covenant in Lent 2, a covenant in Lent 3. Lent 4 is a little bit odd. It's This is when the, the serpents keep it... <laughs> <laughs> keep biting everybody. Uh, God is addressing something in Lent 4, and then Lent 5 will be the new covenant promise in Jeremiah. Yeah. So if you're looking for a theme uh, or, or for throughout Thread. Lent, you might want to look at these covenantal relationships. That's not even the right word. I would say these covenantal initiatives that God makes at various points in the mm-hmm. uh, in the Older Testament. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so here's one with Noah, but it's also a covenant with every living creature that is with you, including the birds and the animals, wild beasts again. Wild beast. That's the that's the commitment. It's not just God's covenant with a person or a family or a species. It's God's covenant to the whole world. To the cosmos. And probably and, even the creepy crawly thing. Uh, yes, God is so into those creepy crawly things. So that 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 triple th- theme that I I talked about uh, when we were looking at the gospel um, th- here is uh, we we were talking about the uh, interruption and the intensity of the the reality of the struggle. Well, here is the inauguration uh, in a different sense uh, because we're back to the beginning, or we're back to the beginning again. Um, uh, in some ways captured very well. Thank you, Hollywood Russell Crowe, uh, in the movie Noah, uh, which, you know, at the introduction, it says, uh, it, so, you know, we begin again or, or something like that is the words. But Lent is the season for us to do this. Um, I, and I, I would I would say maybe, well, it's always true for us, but or for any people in their time, but particularly for us uh, in the midst of all the hurt and horror that's in the world it, that is in need of redemption and reconciliation. Um, this year, this season of Lent, uh, I would like to invite uh, our listeners, our preachers to invite their listeners to receive this, to receive this as the prologue that it is uh, and by that prologue, I read Genesis 1 through 12, 1 through 11 as a prologue that sets up the rest of the narrative. And so, as you mentioned, Matt, uh, the covenants that are established throughout this portion, um, this is an unconditional promise uh, that God makes with Noah, uh, that, that, there, that God is the guarantee tour here regardless of humanity's response and i i think there's that's a way of lifting up the presence of god and the promise of god uh and that this is the beginning of what god has always been doing so it's actually the beginning again to repeat myself and in reading it in that way we see that this is that the entire narrative has been a witness of god eventually uh, evident in Jesus of an unconditional interruption of redemption and blessing into the reality of the horrors and hurts that are so blatant if we w- are watching the news around the world today. I think the covenant's also a protection from God um, and, and the horrors of God in those early chapters of Genesis, in that the covenant also kind of um, constricts God's options. Mm. Uh, you know, the, in some ways, uh, Song Me Susie Park's commentary talks about this, right? What's problematic about the right. depiction of a God who sends a flood and then needs a reminder. Because <laughs> it's part of, part of the term of the covenant is God's like, oh yeah, I'll see the rainbow and then remember not to destroy you again. <laughs> it's, there's, a, there's a wildness and an and, and uncontrollability, is that a word, uh, to the God of, the, of this part of Genesis. I'm not sure ever fully goes away, but the covenant becomes a kind of means by which God is learning to kind of set the terms for engagement with humanity and the world. And it's, and fortunately the covenant is trustworthy in terms of what it promises to do, right? How it, 
it promises to set the terms for that, which will be interesting as we go on and look at more covenants too. I think uh, too, the going back to your initial comments, Matt, about I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds and rest of the animals, every animal and all the creeping, creepy, creeping, creepy things. We call it. Um, We're still not sure. It doesn't say spiders necessarily. It doesn't say spiders, which, oh, gosh. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I... You had to get specific, also, didn't you? <laughs> on spiders. Ooh. Big hairy spiders. Um, uh, one of the things that it makes me think of is actually hearing the the ripping apart of the heavens in a different way. I mean, we, the commentary talks about that and we've talked about that numerous times about the heavens ripping apart and then the curtain, the curtain ripping apart and the, uh, the way in which then that which separates us from God is no longer so on and so forth. But it, the heavens ripping apart connected to this story and the covenant made with all the living creatures is, I think, an interesting connection to the way in which, uh, the way in which, you know, God does not, God is does not reside in the heavens. God is deeply committed to <laughs> the creation God has made, and yes. and so and in and in Jesus, it's a it, it is a affirmation of what also God made was. Adam and Eve and committed to humanity. And so uh, there, I think one could maybe make a connection there that that ripping apart and God is, God is present means that, you know, uh, this, this covenant with the entirety of the, of the cosmos, not only us, but, but God, the earth (laughs) as well. Um, And not, and not, not just the fact that God is in the heavens. So that's another connection I I might pursue homiletically where I'm in, I'm in a placed in this situation. I'm in a, a, a I I was reading um I was reading the commentary and it made me it made me hold to the awesomeness of God. And then it 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 lifts up for me just how great in great in a way that great is enough to be feared. I mean, that's how great God is. And yet, this God is so good. And, and so, Matt, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit on the reminder to God, because I think God is so good that the reminder is to us. That, and I've said this before, I want a God who can handle the horrors of this world. I want a God who addresses the oppressor. I want the God who doesn't just sort of say nice little warm, fuzzy things about people who other folks and out of their self righteousness think that they can marginalize them. I want. I want a God who says, um, as you were saying, Caroline, I've made this commitment with humanity as I have created humanity, and I'm not giving up on that. And, And this sign becomes a reminder to us that God is great enough to do this, but God is good enough that God won't. And so the sign is for us, and I think you said this, Caroline, the sign is for us to know that God is faithful. Maybe this is the last thing you said, Matt, that God is faithful to keep that covenant that is made. Um, I, there are moments when I, when I think of the horrors and the traumas and the hatred and the othering and when I think of what people have experienced, what I, what I think of the things that we're doing right now, some people doing in the name of this God, which I would say is breaking a commandment, but that's another chapter. Um, I want a God that will grab their attention and say, I don't destroy the world like that. Sure, I could. 
but that's not how I operate. I I I I, I want that all communicated. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Psalm twenty five. What would you? How would you use this this sun this Sunday first Sunday of Lent? I liked what um, the commentator did here, and I'm going to quote uh, that, that it's a prayer for help. Where where uh, Matthew said, when we pray for help. We're not merely summoning God to perform a service. Instead, we're placing our trust and hope in the relationship that exists between the Lord and us as God's people. Um, so I think that this is uh, this psalm, the psalm gives us a workable response to the Lenten season of reflection um, in the in the sense of the creator. The, the creator sustaining um, a, 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 a horrible world, but sustaining it not in its horror. Uh, a God who knows, I, I've said this before, a God who knows when enough is enough. And this goes with, I thought about this when you were speaking, Matt, this goes along with God and God's greatness and capacity for horror to say, I know when enough is enough, even in what I'm capable of doing. And I think this psalm, if it's prayed in this sense of this is a God who is trustworthy, uh, this is a God who is faithful, um, that we acknowledge that that in trust, in humbling ourselves before this great God and trusting this God's goodness, that we can acknowledge our need for this God because we are capable of being the oppressor as well as sometimes being oppressed. And so we need this God to help us out. When I read this Psalm, I thought, I bet Jesus prayed this in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. I thought, help me, if Holy it's a Ghost. Psalm for help, a prayer for help. That's how I would connect it, that Jesus knew this Psalm and Jesus knew like the, the section that you lifted up out of the commentary uh, we're not merely summoning God to perform a service. We're placing our trust and hope in the relationship that exists uh, between. So that's that's how I would use it. This, uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, this is, yep, this is one of the Psalms. I mean, he's got 40 days. It's a long time. So, you know, probably had a couple, he could have three Psalms a day, right? <laughs> Am I doing my math? Uh, yeah. So maybe this was one of the Psalms that he, Probably on day 29, I'm thinking. <laughs> Probably had like a read through the Bible. Yeah. Read through the Bible in 40 days, little yeah. chart. Yeah. I really like that idea. It's, it's you know, a way that the lectionary invites us in to do some creativity mm -hmm. um, in terms of thinking about what sustains Jesus. What does it mean when the angels minister to him? Uh, even to say what, if we can cheat a little bit, what did Matthew and Luke tell us about the nature of these tests? Um, in that his, his conception of what does it mean to be son of God is being put on the table, so to speak. And he's being asked to choose what's that going to mean for him? How will he constrain his own choices? Uh, and what kind of vision of power was he going, is he going to choose? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, you know, the language in verses four and five, I think are particularly helpful there in imagining that. In you know what's what's the danger of the test in the wilderness? Is he mm -hmm. going to lose, mm -hmm. or is it that he's going to embrace a certain vision of divine prerogative? That's going to be mm -hmm. really bad news for all of us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How about First Peter, chapter three, eighteen through twenty-two? Well, Matt just gave is this us a here great segue. Of, I think it's here because of Genesis nine. Yeah, that's what I think so too. Okay, I thought Matt just gave a, a great segue into that oh, uh, in terms of the I didn't choice. Catch that. What did he do? Yeah, well, what that's what I heard what yeah. I when when you <laughs> you said podcast. you know uh, what what choice what choice will Jesus make? You will uh, will he take this di di mm. divine prerogative, um, and then he, he doesn't, um, you know? And this text describes that. Jesus suffered and he, he could have, you know, like you said, yeah. it would have been bad for all of us if he had chosen a different way out, but he doesn't. Um, that's what I heard uh, 
as 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 Matt was speaking just just before. Wow, I'm glad you picked that up because well, <laughs> I was just stuck with no one. The ark and eight persons were saved through water, and that that's in the, the text. I got out. <laughs> yeah, it's, but the preacher Matt gave me that well, one of the <laughs> one of the. <laughs> <sighs> You weren't listening to what I was saying about Psalm 25, whatever it was. I was listening. Anyway, I just didn't make that connection. You we were so worried that we were going to have to talk about 1 Peter 3. Um, <laughs> one I of the, was listening. I mean, one of the um, theories. <laughs> I wasn't. One, one of the theories about, about, uh, about this passage in 1 Peter 3 well, most people probably know this is where we get like he descended into hell, right? right? And the whole harrowing of hell is 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 not spelled out in this passage, but this passage becomes a sick. launch point for later church reflection on Holy Saturday. But one of the one of the dominant theories about what in the world First Peter is actually talking about here is that the people Jesus goes to proclaim to are specifically the people who got wiped out during the time of Noah. In other words, it's not like hell as the church in a post Dante world would understand it, nor is it everybody who's ever died. But in particular, there's a kind of obligation back to these people who were wiped out, who need a kind of a, a second chance of sorts. You know what I mean? So in some ways, it's an yeah. undoing of the wrath of the flood. Yeah, is a possibility too. So it 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 helps. It's not really long enough to tame all the moral difficulties of the flood narrative, but at least it's it's this. Um, how would God close the circle? How would a truly merciful God that we meet in Jesus Christ somehow close the circle on that? So you could preach on that. Yeah. Couldn't you? The, Couldn't we? I could. Couldn't somebody? I think that's. Sure. Good. I think that's good news. You two are preaching professors. How it relates to baptism is, I'll leave that up to you too. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's the watery flood, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. So, yeah. Yeah. I would just say there are many ways in which the New Testament interprets the symbolism or the significance of baptism, and this is one. And here is a place which then is an entirely different sermon. But. I'm sure a good one for a preacher who wants to take that on. <laughs>